Good afternoon, Tom. I'm happy to be interviewing you again. We've had several questions come up from your various interviews. I'm thinking back to one where someone asked, what would your equation be? Einstein had E equals MC squared, and I think you came up with R equals I, reality equals information. Not exactly an equation. Right, that's just an identity. An identity. Yeah. But you do use in your My Big Toe, you, you do everything scientifically. You've derived your big toe from two assumptions only. And you use computer analogy to present your big picture. Yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a, uh, a natural metaphor when consciousness is modeled as an information system then computers, uh, you know, it's kind of a natural way of, of dealing with information and information systems. So it's a, it's a very good uh, metaphor to fit the, to fit the reality. You know, the metaphor needs to fit the reality, otherwise the metaphor isn't a good metaphor. So. It is, and so many people can identify with that, especially your computer science people and your tech people. They really uh, can easily see that. And analogy. the young people. And the young people. The young people who are used to playing uh, you know, virtual reality games, they, they seem to pick up on that. Of course. Very You've quickly. also said consciousness is the computer. Mm -hmm. um, you've said that consciousness, you know, we, as, as part of consciousness, not being separate from it, are, we're information. Who are we, exactly? And other than a set of uh, a data file, who are we really? Where is our free will exercised? And when is it not exercised? Okay. Well, the question is, who are we? Depends on your perspective of we. You know, what, what is us? Because we exist in multiple levels. We, when we talk about, well, you know, who am I, you know, then the person saying that is often talking about the I that is the, the player in this virtual reality game. So it's the I, the character. Okay, well that's one level of being for, a, for an I, you know, for you, for I. Uh, one, one level is this character in this virtual reality. But then there is a, a larger I also. You know, who am I? And if we get above just the character in this virtual reality, then we're talking about, you know, you as a as a um, as a being. That's the individuated unit of consciousness that I you know, I use that acronym, the I U O C, individuated unit of consciousness. The individuated unit of consciousness isn't the I here in physical, you know, quote unquote physical form in this virtual reality. That's just a, a fragment or a piece of that of that individuated unit of consciousness. So the individuated unit of consciousness is a, is a uh, kind of a, a larger I, a capital I, if you will, compared to a little I. Uh, a little I in a, in a little picture, in a little toe, which is this physical universe, or a capital I in a, in a, bigger, a bigger picture, a big toe, which is consciousness. So those are two differences. Well now, what about that? Well the little I is what I refer to as, as a, uh, I guess it's a free will awareness unit. And you know, that free will awareness unit is basically the subset of the individuated unit of consciousness that is limited to just getting the data stream that is constrained by the rule set here for this physical reality. This physical reality is a rule set, and its rule set represents the this evolved physical reality. So that's the big difference between, um, say, World of Warcraft and Sims and our virtual reality is that their virtual reality, the Sims and World of Warcraft, is programmed. Somebody to sit down and program. So every blade of grass, every tree, every knot hole in every tree had to be put in by a programmer. In our virtual reality, it doesn't work like that. Our virtual reality evolved. It started with a few um, rules, 
which we call the rule set. And it started with a list of initial conditions and those specified, as best we can tell, a, a, very, a small, small spot of very hot plasma energy, if you will, in a small ball. And then when the run button was hit, that, that uh, ball of energy was allowed to expand. Now we're in a simulation. We're simulating this ball of energy. How much energy does it have? That's an input constant, E. You know, E sub zero, you know, the initial condition on the energy. How hot was it? Well, that's temperature. Temperature sub zero. It's, these were just initial conditions input into the simulation. The rules had to do with things like gravity, you know, energy exchange among particles and so on. That's the rules for the rule set. So you put all this together, you hit the run button, and you let this small ball of energy expand. Okay, now this is the big digital bang, right? So it's the big bang except in simulation. Okay, now, what happens then is the same as the normal Big Bang that you hear, except it's in simulation. So it expanded. As it expanded, things coalesced, you know, matter coalesced because of gravity, and you ended up with suns, you ended up with planets, you ended up with our universe. Stars get created, stars get consumed, and you have this big, more or less stable, environment that you've created. Now it's a virtual environment and it's a simulation. So within that planet, the one we call Earth anyway, um, you know, the right collection of amino acids got together or to produce a first cell or perhaps the first cell was just specified there. It really doesn't matter. It could have just specified there and then let it evolve. So we have evolution then that has created our planet. All the you know, the trees and bushes, all the fauna, as well as the, the plants and animals and everything that's here just evolved. Why? Because they were probable to evolve. What does evolution mean? It means moving to states of higher entropy to states of lower entropy based on the environment. So it's a, it's a lower entropy environment when matter coalesced into suns and planets and so on. That's more structure in the energy, you see. When cells multiply and divide and become uh, uh, more complex structures that are more survivable, so that, you know, procreation and survivability then in this virtual reality become the criteria for evolution. But in the, the bigger system, in the consciousness system, uh, it's low entropy is the criteria for more evolution. So that kind of sets the, the key of you know, this physical reality relative to the consciousness system that was the one that created the program, if you will, that's running to create our virtual reality. So you are an individuated unit of consciousness, which is a member of the, of the consciousness system. It's a subset of the consciousness system. And you have this virtual reality that provides us with constraints. So that's all the virtual reality does, is provide us with constraints. So let's get back now to our free will awareness unit. What's that? It's a subset of our individuated unit of consciousness, a chunk of big C consciousness. But it's constrained, the free will awareness unit is constrained to only experience things within the constraints of this virtual reality simulation. So in this virtual reality simulation, things evolved and eventually humans evolved. So here we are with humans and humans have constraints. They can only think so fast. They can only remember so much. They can only jump so high. They can only run so fast, you know, etc. These are all the constraints based on our biology, our environment, the gravity on the planet. You know, all of these things are part of the, the uh, Rule set. So when we have an experience, that's data. It's all just data. You know, and I shouldn't say just data because the just makes it sound like maybe it's you know second class or not that important, but it's it's data. And we get that data and act on it within the constraints of the rule sets that created this reality. Well, it was created out of initial conditions and rule sets, basically, and then run on a computer. So the brain doesn't remember anything. The brain doesn't compute anything. The brain doesn't do any analysis. 
It doesn't really think. The brain is just a virtual brain. It's part of this evolved simulation, if you will. So the brain is, is a virtual brain in a virtual body, in a virtual reality. The brain isn't storing information. That information is stored in consciousness. You see, we are consciousness. So here we are, this free will awareness unit. All of our experience, our data stream, has to fit within the rule set of this virtual reality. And in this virtual reality, we can only say, remember so much. We have memory. Well, that memory belongs in the free will awareness unit. That's consciousness. How much can we remember? Uh, you know, how much can we process? Can we learn uh, algebra, calculus, and differential equations in five minutes? No, our brains don't work like that. You know, can we read a 600-page novel in, you know, in, in 10 minutes? No, we can't process. We can't even turn the pages that fast. Our muscles and hands and things can't do that. So that's outside the limits. That's outside of our constraints. So this free will awareness unit can't have any experience, which is its input from data, that falls outside of what this virtual reality can do and it's an evolved virtual reality, it wasn't programmed. You see, so that's kind of the setup. So now we've defined like a free will awareness unit is this subset of the individuated units of consciousness that's limited to a data stream that can only give it experience and data, and that's what experience is, it's data. Whether we think of it coming through our eyes and ears and touch and smell, it's just data. So this free will awareness unit is getting data, just as we seem to get data through our senses here. Well. This is, you know, this is a multiplayer game. So we get this data. The data has to be within the bounds of the rule set. And that then defines what I'd call our little c consciousness. It's still a part of the larger consciousness system, but it's just this free will awareness unit that has free will to make choices within this virtual reality multiplayer game. Okay, so now we're, we've defined two things, a free will awareness unit and an individuated unit of consciousness, getting on to your, to your question, but we needed to kind of get the, you know, get all that going in the first place so that the terms would make sense. So we have this little c consciousness, which is our, which is our local awareness here in this reality frame. That's our little c consciousness. And many people confuse that with all of consciousness. You know, it's just our little, consciousness of, of this uh, avatar or character in this virtual reality, and that's what consciousness is. Well, that's not what consciousness is. That's just little c consciousness, our local awareness in this local virtual reality. There are other virtual realities. This is just our local, sort of like our local neighborhood, right? our local universe. So that's kind of how the piece parts go together. Now, all of these things are metaphors. I'm breaking this down into pieces so that we can think about it. The amount of complexity we can use to form our concepts is limited. Okay, so we have to break it down into pieces that aren't too out there and airy that we don't feel like they make sense to us, that we can't get our arms around them. You see, we don't want it to be too abstract. So that's why we end up with free will awareness units, individual units of consciousness. It's all just one seamless thing. It's not broken into these pieces. So don't think that all the pieces are real little pieces out there doing things because that's just a habit of thinking inside of this virtual reality where everything is separate in its own box. So we can't imagine anything that, isn't, that doesn't have its own separateness because one of our rule sets says that no two things can locate the same, you know, can be in the same place at the same time. Well, that's a, that's a rule of separateness. We're all independent and separate here. So when we start thinking of higher selves and over selves, we turn them into separate entities, just like we're all separate entities. But this separateness is only a characteristic of this virtual reality. See, that's part of the virtual reality. So though I'm breaking it into all these subsets and pieces, these are metaphors for something that is uh, really just one big thing, one system. But we can't deal with it in that form because here we are limited by the rule set and this evolution that produced this universe and this virtual reality. We're kind of limited by, by the concepts and the thinking that we can do with this virtual brain. 
Okay. Now, I guess some people say, well, but if it's just a virtual brain, how come if somebody hits you in the head and does brain damage, that, well, that just changes the limitations, right? The constraints on you now are different. Somebody's caved in part of your skull, your brain now has more constraints on it than it did before. So the data that's stream that you get has to follow the constraints of this virtual brain, of this virtual character that you're now playing. So all those things, you know, apply just the same. Anyway, so we're, let's, let's bag on up the chain a little bit more. So we've got the, we've got the individuated units of consciousness, and we have now established virtual realities. And we see this virtual reality as just a simulation. Well, there are many such simulations for different purposes. When you die in this virtual reality, you become aware in a different virtual reality. That's a transition virtual reality where, where uh, after dying here, you get kind of reoriented and, and get the plan, you know, what's going to happen next and so on. And that's a virtual reality. When you go out of body, that's a virtual reality. When you dream, that's a different virtual reality. You know, all of these, these kind of various places we go with our mind, there's different rule sets. In the dream world, it's a different rule set. In dream worlds, we can fly. In dream worlds, things don't have to have a uh, causal existence. You can just suddenly be in a situation where you have to react. It doesn't have to lead up to that situation like it does here. We don't need a string of causal event, events. You can just start there, right in the middle. That's a different kind of uh, rule set. It's a different reality frame. So now, whenever we're in a virtual reality, we can, call it, we can call that an experiential space. It's a space that we can experience in. It's a space where we're getting a data stream from a rendering engine, if you like, that renders to us what we see in that virtual reality, in that particular virtual reality game. So yes, the dreaming reality is a different virtual reality game than this physical reality. No different, one isn't more real or less real than the other. They're just different. Okay. So here we are, consciousness. A subset of an individuated unit of consciousness experiencing this physical reality by limiting ourselves to data that meets the constraints of this evolved, this evolved virtual reality called our physical universe. So what's going on now at the, at the next level up and how are we connected to the larger consciousness system? It's kind of where you were, you were going with the question. As long as we're in a virtual reality, we have experience, we're getting a data stream, and we have free will. Free will allows us to, to um, make choices. We have the free will to choose among those things that are in our decision space. Our decision space is simply a, a set of those choices that we have that are available to us. And I don't mean available in a theoretical way, but available in a practical way to us. So we look at a, you know, some event happens, something happens, and we may immediately count off, well, there's 10 choices that we could make and how we react to that thing and what we do. There may really be 100 choices, but we're only aware of 10 of them, because often they're choices that, for reasons of our fear and our belief and other things that we have that we don't know we have. But our decision space is just that set that we know we have. These are all the choices that we can practically make, not theoretically make. That's decision space, and we have a free will just to pick one within that set. Okay, so that's how one defines free will. Free will is not the ability to do whatever you want or have it however you want it. Free will is an ability to choose among the various options and choices that present themselves to you. So as you see, free will is not incompatible at all with a computer simulation. They're, they're not, uh, you know, there's no incompatibility there at all. You just need enough, uh, 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 you know, a situation wherein there is no, there is no one logically correct algorithmic solution because you don't have enough data. See, most of our important choices, we don't have enough data to make a deductive choice. Sometimes we believe that we do. We often think we're more logical than we are, but we don't make a whole lot of our choices out of logic because we don't have enough data to make those choices. We're 
guessing all the time. What did they mean by that? See, we have to interpret data. So data always comes, not pure, but tainted by our own beliefs, our own uh, fears, all of that stuff taint our data. We get data, we interpret it based on our experience. Okay, so as we interpret it, is that the real data? That's just our interpretation of the data. There is no real data, you see? So we hardly ever have a situation so simple that we can deductively determine what's logical. Simple things, yes. I lost my car keys. Well, I can be logical and I can say, where's the last places I've been? Okay, I, you know, I had my car keys an hour ago. I haven't left the house. Therefore, deductive logic would say, they're somewhere in the house unless somebody else picked them up and carried them away, which is unlikely as far as probability goes. So now I know I need to look in the house. Well, where was I last in the house? You see, so we can use logic to do very simple problems like that. But should I marry this girl or should I marry this guy? You know, what, you know, what kind of life might we have? Where might that take me? How many children should I have? Should I have another child? or stop with two, three, or one, or whatever. These are choices that are important to you. Should I take this job? Should I take this promotion? Should I take this demotion so that it gives me more flexibility later? You know, all choices of which you do not have enough data to make a logical decision. So here we are, we don't make logical decisions because we don't have enough information. And what we do though is have choices. Well, I could take that you know, job or not take that job. I can marry this person or not. You know, we can do these things and we make our choices. And how we make those choices depends whether we grow up or don't grow up. We lower our entropy or not. All right, so back to the main subject. So if you are in a virtual reality of some sort, you have choices. You have free will. You have experience. You have a data stream that's giving you experience. Okay? And you're making these choices based upon the quality of your being. How much fear do you have? How much love do you have? You know, what are your beliefs? So all of these then limit your experience, which you're interpreting from the data. And if you don't have a virtual reality, if you're not in a virtual reality, then you're not in an experiential environment, you're not experiencing, you're not getting the data stream, and you do not have free will. Well, what situation would that be? That would be the situation where you're just basically a set of data, and by that I mean experience, data. All of the experiences that you at the individuated unit of consciousness and all of the free will awareness units you've ever, you know, um, cordoned off to play in a virtual reality game. So all the experiences from all the virtual realities you've ever been in as a free will awareness unit, all together, it's all that data, every feeling, every thought, every event, every choice, every set of circumstances, every emotion, every feeling, all of that data is what I'm calling your data set. Okay, it's all that together. And because of all the choices you've made, how much have you lowered your entropy? How much quality have you gained in your consciousness? Uh, what's the level of your, or what's the, the extent of your evolution of your consciousness? So that's all the data that you have. And let's just call that a data folder. That's a data folder, you know, called Tom. Well, there's that data folder called Tom. None of that data now is projected into any virtual reality. It has no free will. It has no data stream. It has no experience. It's just potential. So it's a part of the larger consciousness system. Okay, and you're thinking, oh, that's awful, no free will, it's dead. No, it's just like, you know, your nose does not have free will. It's just part of a system with free will. At that point, Tom is a data package that's just a part of the larger consciousness system, like the nose is a part of a, the body. Now, the larger consciousness system has free will, then you're just a part of it. You don't need free will. You have no choices. There's no data stream. You're not projected in virtual reality. So see, that's kind of the, if you want to take it back to kind of the furthest away that you can get from a free will awareness unit interacting here, then it would be 
basically this data file, and it really wouldn't have Tom written on it because Tom's just the name of this virtual character. You see, it would it would have the individuated unit of consciousness written on it. You know, it would be that individuated unit of consciousness. It wouldn't be Tom because it's been Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Susie, and Sally, and maybe uh, you know Fido, and. Uh, you know, trigger, you know, it, it could have been all of these various things. But it's very unique. But it's unique. It's you. It's me, it's my experience, it's the, it's the culmination, it's everything I've done, felt, thought, been, every action done, you know, all of that. And that's unique, because there isn't any other in, individuated unit of consciousness that has had my experience. Why is that? Because my experience is interpreted from the data I get, even if Others had the exact same data come to them, which is also impossible because they didn't look in the same direction at the same time from the same point as me, then their data couldn't be the same as mine. But even if it was, I would interpret that data differently. So yes, it's entirely unique folder, if you will, of my individuated unit of consciousness, my chunk of consciousness. But if I'm not being, and we'll use the gaming metaphor, if I'm not being played, in a virtual reality somewhere, then I have no need for free will. I have no data stream. I, I'm not interacting. If you're interacting, then you're in a virtual reality, you see. So we as consciousness can move around in virtual realities. That's what we do. And in every virtual reality, we have free will. When we die in this physical universe, we end up awake in some other virtual reality. Now, of course, we say this is physical and that's non-physical, but physical and non-physical are just a point of view. Wherever you happen to be, whatever data stream you happen to be getting, that appears to be physical and everything else appears to be non-physical. When you're in a dream, this universe, this physical universe is non-physical and the dream world seems physical. So physical and non-physical aren't fundamental characteristics of any place. And it isn't that any virtual reality is more real or less real than any other. They're all just different. They all have their purpose. They're all uh, basically there for us to experience in. Okay? So that we can, out of this experience, we have decision space, we make choices, we can evolve the quality of our consciousness. So that's what the virtual realities are for. So the virtual reality you go to after you die in this game, in this physical reality game, is a virtual reality where you, you um, kind of process in, if you will, get ready and get prepared to come back to a virtual reality like this one, because this one is where you get most of the traction on your ability to grow up because there's more feedback, there's more you know, connection. It's a, it, the rules are tighter here in this virtual reality. So it's a good place to grow up because you get immediate feedback from the way you are you know, from your thoughts, from what you think creates your reality, your intent is, is major uh, as far as, uh, you know, what happens to you in this reality. So it's a, it's a good learning lab. So when we are not in a virtual reality, mm -hmm. we are existing as potential, but that potential is all of our information because we remain an individuated unit of consciousness. Right. Now, when we're in that state and we then transfer to a virtual reality which would allow us to plan another life experience packet, do we take all of the quality of being an experience with us? Yes, of course. And the reason that we have to do that is because learning and growing, increasing the quality of your consciousness is a cumulative thing like learning anything is cumulative. Uh, the more you know about biology, then the more you can know more about biology. You know, it's cumulative. You, you don't uh, start at the end, you start at the beginning as far as education and knowledge goes. So yes, you take whatever you've learned to that point and you build on that to grow, to become more than that. So this is, this, uh, this Increasing the quality of your consciousness is an evolutionary process. Evolution works by building on what you've got to this point. So you've evolved from whatever you have been to what you are, and now 
evolution will take you from what you are to what you will become, you know, the next step. So you can't, you can't jump or leap into things, you have to evolve. So you always have to start with whatever you are. So this data packet we're talking about that's just in the larger consciousness system like the nose is on our face, it's just potential. It has the potential to go interact. It has the potential to learn, to evolve, to change and become something else. And it can't do that if it's just sitting there as a data pack. It's just potential. So you want to, you know, the consciousness system then wants to take that and you know, we're using the metaphor, you know, for like a, a video game, you know, so he wants to play that potential in a game so that that potential can, can learn, can grow, can develop and become more. That's the point. So obviously most of us don't spend much time not in a virtual reality. You see, we're almost always in some virtual reality because we're always learning and growing. So we almost always have free will. We almost always are in one virtual reality or another and sometimes two or three at the same time. We're always engaged in growing and learning. Very seldom is it that we're just potential someplace without free will, you know, waiting to be played. That's a theoretical thing, but not really much of a practical thing, you see, because why would the system keep potential growth sitting on the shelf? Well, there are maybe some good reasons. One is that potential growth just doesn't have a lot of potential. It's just not growing. It's not contributing to the whole. It's failing to evolve. It may even be de-evolving. And even if it de-evolves some, it still has the potential to turn around and evolve. But it may have got to the point where the potential is so small that there's no point taking up space in the simulation anymore. So I can see that something like that may be put on the shelf, maybe, uh, maybe backed up, maybe even erased and, and, uh, you know, and deleted in favor of something more productive. After all, this is, a, this is an evolving system. You know? Are you aware of any type of potential that has played these virtual realities and been put on the shelf? Been put on the shelf and deleted? No, I'm not personally aware of any of any of that ever happening. Um, but I can see from a picture of a computer system. So here you are. You're this big, larger consciousness system. You're a digital information field, if you will, that is evolving by lowering the entropy of the system. If you have some bits that are just not working for you, you know, they're just there and maybe even working against you, I can see that eventually you do, and again, this is a probabilistic thing, so you look at the probability. What's the probability that these bits will become productive? Well, it's fine if they get unproductive for a while, but they still have potential for being productive. So you work with them and work with them. If they get to a point where there's no potential, why wouldn't the system, you know, put those on the shelf or you know, essentially delete them? Why carry along unproductive parts of the program that aren't helping you, you, the larger consciousness system, evolve. So yes, I would think definitely that's a possibility. Any system that, uh, you know, it's sort of like being the government and you can't fire anybody, right? Well, you end up with a lot of deadwood sometimes because people know they've got a job for life. If you've ever got a situation where there's a job for life, you're going to have certain numbers of people not operating at a very, you know, productive level. So it's just the way it is, you know. <laughs> Nothing negative about government employees. I know, you know, the well, one is one of those and <laughs> she works very, very hard. Yes, but, she does. Uh, you know, many government employees work very, very hard and very dedicated. But it's just, the point is, if you have a situation where there is a job for life, you will have some people who abuse that and will goof off rather than produce because they don't have to worry about consequences. I can't imagine a working system doing that. You know, why would why would it uh, suffer that inefficiency? So yes, I think it's a you know that can happen. A person can devolve to the point that their potential for progress gets past you know gets lower than a certain point. Then that character doesn't get played. Now, if you're if you're working Sims or you're working the World of Warcraft, it's the same thing. 
you may have some character that you designed, you know, it had this kind of levels and this kind of abilities and it was a magic worker or a, I don't know what all the different things are, you know, it was different kinds of characters with different kinds of attributes and you may have some of those characters that work really well for you and they go up their levels, they meet their tasks and uh, you do real well with them. And then you may have other characters that you designed that just never seem to get anywhere, you know, and you've played them and played them, but, well, what do you do? You play the ones that work and you stop playing the ones that don't, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. So I expect that's here too. So that's just the nature of the, of a, of a system like ours of consciousness is that, uh, you know, you need to be part of the solution or at least have potential to become part of the solution, or, you know, you uh, probably won't get played. And most of us, I would say, are played all the time because we do have potential and we are, you know, whether we go forward or backward isn't as important as we still have that potential and we're still kind of trying to get someplace. As long as you put in a little effort, my guess is that you're, you're one of the you're one of the better players if you're actually aware enough to be putting in some effort. And better players get attention. Better players not only get played more, but they get helped more. So if you wonder, you know, why has this system abandoned me, you know? Why do I not have guides that give me good advice? You know, where is my help here? I need some, I need some help. Everything is terrible and uh, I need a little help. Well, if you are one of the if you're trying, really making an effort, not just whining about things aren't the way you want them, but are really trying to make an effort, then the system will go out of its way to help you, to give you opportunities. But if you're not aware enough to grab those opportunities, and every time you get an opportunity, you fail to grab it, well, eventually the system will stop you know, wasting its time you know, uh, trying to help you so much because you're not yet ready for help. And often we have to flounder and flounder and flounder to where we make ourselves so miserable before we open up and start, you know, being ready to change, to do something differently. I think that happened to Neil Donald Walsh and his yes. conversations with God. Right. It seems that he hit He rock hit bottom home. and he got to rock bottom. It's finally like, all right, oh, you know, right. I can't get worse. Help. Yes. And he got the help. He did. So it does that way. Once you're ready to uh, develop some of your potential, then you will get all the help that you can use. If you're not ready, you won't get a whole lot of help because it won't, <laughs> the help actually won't be helpful because you, you still have to do it. Nobody can help you by doing it for you. You know, you still have to do it. So that's the key. So that's kind of the whole big picture. And, uh, you know, so here we are, these free will awareness units playing in a game called Physical Reality 101 here in this universe. And we have these decision spaces and we're making choices and we're either actualizing our potential or we're deactualizing our, you know, not actualizing our potential. That's kind of the big scheme. I think you've told it uh, well from a scientific viewpoint. I did have one good friend comment about how these life experience packets, and I guess it's what some would call reincarnation, are so full of emotion, so full of potential to assist people in overcoming phobias, fears, and different things like that. And that leads me to the question, when you mentioned that our full potential comes back into a, another life experience packet, and you bring everything with you. I'm guessing that you also bring the good and the bad. Yes, you bring, again, learning has to be cumulative. You know, you, as, you, as you go through schools from kindergarten you know, up through graduate school, whatever, every, every time you hit the next level, you, know, you graduate to the next class, you build on what you had before. And that also includes your fear. You know, it's not just your intellectual learning like it is in our, our schools tend to be focused just on intellectual learning. But of course we know there's learning that goes on at a different level. There's learning at the being level, who we are. We call that sometimes maturity or something else that doesn't have to do with learning facts. 
and processes. It has to do with growing up. See, that's what we're talking about at the being level. So yes, whatever you are after, you know, let's say you've had, you know, six million choices in 10 lifetimes and you've made all those choices, well, then that puts you in a state of potential. Now, had you made better choices, you might have had higher potential. Had you made worse choices, you may have a lower potential. You see, your potential to grow up depends, you know, to grow up in the next step. Let's say your potential in fourth grade depends on kind of where and what you were when you got out of third grade. If you get out of third grade and you still can't read, you can't add, you can't do anything, then your potential in fourth grade gets to be well, the potentials, maybe he won't make as much out of fourth grade, but then you could catch up. You could get serious and you could do better than almost anybody else in fourth grade because suddenly, instead of goofing off and, and you know, not trying to learn anything, you get more serious about it, then you could excel. So I guess we all have the, the fundamental theoretical potential to grow up and become love. That's all, you know, when I talk about potential, we all have that potential. We can all grow up to become love. But that's theoretical potential. Practical potential is more like, what are we likely to do? See, what are we likely to do next? Well, here we've had the last 300 lifetimes and we've just kind of, you know, bobbled around from here to there and we've made some good decisions, we made some bad decisions. So what are we likely to do the next time? Well, we're likely to do more of the same unless we change something. By change something means we become more aware. We see what's going on. We realize what we're what we're here for. Then suddenly we can we can do better. So we all have a we all have a uh, our cumulative learning from where we started in our evolution of our particular individuated unit of consciousness. And we've learned, let's say, this much. So here we are. Well, now we go back into an incarnation and we take all of that and we start because you don't want to go backwards. You wouldn't start from zero every time. You'd never, you know. You'd be wasting your time. You take what you've learned. It's not like you have your you go in for a brainwashing and wash out everything you learned, you know, through high school and undergraduate school, and then go into graduate school blank, you know, having to relearn the alphabet in graduate school and, and learn how to count and learn your colors. You know, you don't do that. You take everything you've learned when you go into graduate school. Hopefully, you have enough of that that you've learned that'll enable you to do the work that's in graduate school. So, learning has to be a cumulative process. You know, you can't, you can think of it another way. If you took a, if you took a person and you duplicated them into 10 people and let each one of them go to high school, at the end you'd have 10 high school experiences. Okay, or you could take that same person and let them, let them iteratively do 10, you know, 10 levels. Well, they'd go through high school and that would be, say, one set of levels. Then they go through college, that'd be another set. And then they go through graduate school and then they go into employment and learn more things in this job and that job. Now do that 10 times and what do you end up with? A much bigger, you know, broader, more valuable education after 10 repetitive units as opposed to 10 that are parallel processed. You see, the parallel processing doesn't get you much. It just repeats that thing 10 times. Well, yes, you could take those 10 high school experiences average them, integrate them all together, and you'd have one really great, you know, high school experience out of all of those. But you're still at high school level. Whereas you take one person and have them do high school, then have them do college, then have them do graduate school, and have them maybe get a different degree in graduate school, and have them take a job. And now, through 10 processes, you know a whole lot more than that really super high school experience, you see. So that's why learning has to be cumulative. So yes, when you start a new incarnation, you start with a quality of consciousness. That quality of consciousness is the result of all your cumulative learning up to that point. And by learning, I'm not talking about learning facts, I'm talking about growing up at the being level. And that's what you start with. Now occasionally, you will have in a in a individuated unit of consciousness may have had an experience that was particularly traumatic or particularly engrossing or particularly fantastic or particularly something that really stood out among all the experiences and that experience might reblossom 
okay, in the next incarnation. So if you were terribly afraid of spiders, you know, you may end up in this next being inclined toward being afraid of spiders in this next incarnation. You know, that could be a possibility. Not that you would have to be afraid of spiders necessarily, but you just may be inclined that way because that fear of spiders was such a strong part of your individuated unit of consciousness. Now, most of us, our fears aren't that all-consuming, and they just kind of meld in with everything else. But if you had things that were major, all-consuming things, the probability of, of that kind of a thing happening again would be higher than if you didn't have anything that was particularly all-consuming in your, in your portfolio, if you will, in your, in your resume of past, of past lives. So sometimes there are characteristics that get kind of passed from a past life to a next life, but mostly, no. And the reason not is mostly we're here, you know, we don't come in with, with, with an obsession, okay? Yes, sometimes. Sometimes you get a three-year-old that learns to play the piano, right? And starts playing Bach at, you know, by four. They're, they're playing like a, you know, like a 20-year-old. Well, they come in with maybe a, a, you might say, an obsession or a fixation on that particular skill and art. That's possible. Also, many children, it's been documented recently, many children are recalling past lives very vividly. And unlike perhaps in the past, these children are just allowed to, to speak about it. And one particular set of parents of a little boy who remembered himself as a World War II pilot did not discourage the child. They allowed him to speak his story, and it's become very well known. And um, Dr. Brian Weiss has um, uh, found in his practice of psychiatry that a phobia that you mentioned um, that can come in very strong and has no explanation in this lifetime has been brought out and released from another lifetime. So I know these, not everybody should go and have a past life regression. It may not be helpful for everyone, but I think that children should be listened to. I think that if you have an unexplainable phobia, that might be the thing for you. And that goes for any type of other so-called paranormal, I know you call those normal yeah. under your my big toe, but under any other so-called paranormal experience, such as psychic visions and things like that, we simply have to pay more attention to what we need mm -hmm. and pursue it that way. It's not that everyone will have, as you say, you know, everyone seeks an out-of-body experience because that, that was your beginnings with uh, Robert Monroe. Mm -hmm. Everyone is trying to do that. You should try to pursue, I'm thinking, something that really applies to you, something that is meaningful to you. Listen and be open. And let, allow children to be vocal with the things that sure. they uh, Well, experience. children, of course, up until the age of about seven, tend to be more holistic in their thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, they live in a magical world. So a little more magic, you know, that's invisible doesn't really hit them as very strange. Uh, everything in the world's magic, from automobiles to you know to airplanes to the schools they go to to computers. You know, everything is just kind of they don't know how any of it works. They have no process that can you know to them it's just magic. So up until about seven, where we learn to read, and reading is a logical process. It's taking a bunch of letters and putting it in a string with sounds that have meaning and metaphors attached. We have to learn the meanings and metaphors, and that's a process where we become more left-brained in our ability to um, process information. And at that point, we also get a little more, when we're old enough to do that, we're also old enough to do that in life in general. You know, it's not just reading. We're old enough to kind of process things as logical logical process, and that's when we start to, to uh, let our intellect become more in charge of, you know, what we, uh, what we see and hear. The, the intellect becomes more of a filter on how we interpret data from about that age on, but you go less than that age, they live in a very open, magical space, and things just happen because they do. And when you're in that space, you're open 
you're more open to things. Your beliefs haven't yet narrowed down, you know, to this is acceptable and, and that's not. Okay, so a five-year-old or six-year-old can very easily, you know, interact with, say, past lives or even telepathic kinds of things, or they just know. Sometimes they'll say things out of the blue and you wonder, where did they get that? You know, that's such a, that's such a, uh, you know, an amazing collection of information that then gets put into something. You say, well, they're not really old enough to do that, but they do it anyway because they, they approach more right brain, more holistic in their viewpoint. And that gets kind of, I don't know, squeezed out of them as they get older and they get more acclimated to our culture, which will then tell them, oh, that's nonsense, forget that, you know, it was just a dream, you know, that's not real. You're just imagining it. And eventually they believe that and they let it all go. And some of it they may just be imagining. It's not that every time a child has, you know, sees a boogeyman under a bed that there's really a boogeyman there. Of course, there isn't. You know, it's just that they're, they are more easily connected to the larger system of consciousness than most over seven and particularly most adults are and even particularly more than that most left brain adults are. So yes, you can have those connections, but now sometimes, you know, well let's put it, let's go at it from both ends. Just because you had a terrible fear of spiders sometime in the, some other past life doesn't mean you'll have to have a fear of spiders. What it means it's not that you carry along the details. The details all go away and what's left is just your quality. Now that quality also has in it your fear. Okay, that's part of your quality and makeup. You know, the amount of ego and fear that you have is part of that quality. Well, with that ego and fear, now you come into a new virtual reality and with that fear, you have a higher probability of then localizing what do we call it, projecting, manifesting that fear into something else. It may not be spiders this time. It could be, you know, something else. Snakes or automobile accidents or, you know, assassination or, you know, something that you get frightened about that you really don't have any good logical reason to be frightened about. But now you're just, if you, you know, you're just, uh, what shall we say, expressing that fear in some way. Now it may come back as spiders again, but it doesn't have to. So we can't, well, then let's go to the other end. Let's say here we are and we have some irrational fear. Well, that irrational fear may have started from your environment and you just don't remember it. Like I, uh, a sample of that I use is, was my son and he was barely able to stand on his feet, just kind of staggering around the way new toddlers are. They really toddle, you know. And we visited friends who had a large dog. And my son fell over, which he did every, you know, 10 or 20 steps, he fell over, you know. And he was on his back. And the large dog walked up to him and stood over him and looked down at him. Very friendly large dog. Well, it terrified him because there he was on his back and there was this huge dog, probably weighed three times what he weighed, you know, all the big teeth, you know, panting, tongue hanging out. And Stenner looked at him and it frightened him. There was actually nothing scary about the situation. The dog was not threatened in any way, but it frightened him. So now when he was, you know, that was what, one and a half maybe, one, you know, somewhere between one and two. Well, now here he is, uh, you know, 30 years old and big dogs put him ill at ease. He sees a big dog and some fear will well up. You say, eh, I'm not so sure about that big dog. Big dogs can be dangerous. You see, well, where did that come from? It came from that thing in his environment where he was frightened by a large dog. But it's totally irrational. He's never been attacked, you know, by a dog, or probably known anybody else that has, but he has a he had a fear. Well, he did get over that fear. He did, you know, he did get small dog and whatever, he, he got over that fear. But that's what happens to people. They have these fears and that dog fear could have been to something else, you know, it could have been transferred to another thing. It's hard to say. So here we have people who have fears. They can't think of any logical reason why they should have that fear. You know, they just always have been wary of dogs or wary of spiders or wary of snakes or wary of mountain lions or traffic or something. 
And it could be one of those kinds of things. You also, as a young child, pick up things from your parents. If your parents are fearful, you will pick up that you should be fearful because you pick up things from your parents. So there's another place that you can pick it up that's non-rational. And of course you could pick it up from a past life because that, there was a lot of fear that you came in with that came with your packet, if you will, had a high level of fear in it. Well, that makes you more likely to fear things now. So now maybe it's just that a big dog looked at you on the street, made you afraid, rather than one standing over you because you had this potential fear was greater. Your probability of, of finding fear was higher because that just expresses the level of your, your being. Now what you, what you can do then, one of the ways people deal with this is they, they can go back and realize what it was. So like with my son, he could go back and say, oh yeah, I remember that big dog. And it was just me. It was just my interpretation of the data that was so scary. The dog wasn't scary at all, really, in a sense that the dog wasn't wasn't uh, you know being aggressive it was just my interpretation and then once you understand that it's easier to let go of and say okay i know where that came from you can revisit it as the child let it go and now it works sometimes that now you're not afraid of big dogs or spiders or snakes or automobiles or whatever it kind of goes away that solves it for you so if we can if we can categorize sometimes and name the fear and see an origin, sometimes that will let it go. And accept that at that point, it'll fix the fear, you know, in this particular lifetime. So it doesn't really matter so much whether, let's say you were afraid of spiders in a past life, but you can still use that as a tool to get rid of the fear of spiders. Even if you were never afraid of spiders in a past life, if you can, in your mind, go back to a past life, see a fear of spiders, let go of it, and then let go of it here, it served its purpose, you see? So you have that can work too. So you can use this past life basically as a tool for helping you deal with irrational things that you have now. It doesn't necessarily make the connection that you were afraid of spiders in a past life. That just becomes a, a tool uh, that, working, you know, that you can work with and your mind will find these tools. Your mind will find this tool and say, well, I don't know why. I just see a spider and I want to run, you know, I want to scream. I can't even look at a picture of a spider in a, in a magazine. If I see a picture of a spider in a magazine, you know, I have to turn the page or get rid of it. It bothers me. Well, that's irrational, obviously. And if you, your mind is looking for a place, for an origin of that, well, a past life may be a very good tool for you to find that in. But again, it's not necessarily causal, that you really had that in the past life, but if you can go through that process, it may be helpful to you. A lot of it has to do with belief. It's just the way you believe things are. So we don't want to jump to conclusions all the time because somebody went back, regressed, past life, found the spiders, solved the problem, and now they're okay. That's not necessarily proof that they actually had an experience of spiders in a past life. They may just be using that as a tool. Well, that brings us to proof. Proof is irrelevant, you see. It doesn't matter. Was that useful? Yes. Was that metaphor of past life useful? Yes. Could it affect the present? Yes. You see, it's valuable. It's useful. It's another metaphor that we can use to help us grow up. So the, the point is, well, but was it real? That's the wrong question. It doesn't matter. You know, it's not important. We're not talking about some uh, theoretical notion of realness or not. We're people and we're living and we're here to grow up. Things either work or they don't work. If they work, they're valuable. If they don't work, they're not. When we start labeling things as correct and incorrect, real or not real, mostly that's our ego. And the reason we ask those questions is because we don't know the answer. We're fearful of what we don't know. We have these beliefs that we want every, all the data we get need to fit within our beliefs. Otherwise, it makes us uncomfortable. We, we're fearful if it doesn't fit in our belief. So then we tend to say, well, I don't believe that. Or I do believe that. However, your fear is pushing you to believe it or not to believe it. You see, it doesn't matter. 
all of that's irrelevant. I think your advice on whether it's helpful or not, such as uh, past life experience packets, bringing out and releasing a fear or a phobia, that's one level of them. I think many people have experienced detailed past lives and I think even Bob Monroe mentioned a, a soul group, I think he called it, where various, say a half a dozen past lives or so, are particularly meaningful to the experience or have some sort of lesson here. And they see whole scenes and whole sure. movies and vivid impressions and almost like a movie, mm -hmm. I think you've described that before. That's happened to a lot of people and that has a different purpose and I'm thinking perhaps it's so individual that the individual has to simply figure out for himself what that meaning is. Um, it's, it may be simply, look, this is how large reality is, or look, you might have to, you know, you might have to work on this, or this is the origin of what you're doing now this is why you still have the same purpose going. The purpose in this lifetime is similar to the people that, these five people or six people that you've seen. So there's another level to it that is helpful, but I think what uh, you have hit upon is that this is a very individual thing, and the person needs to be open to that. Right, it's a, it's a, it can be a tool. And there are those people who will go back and, and uh, into their past lives, if you will, and they'll find out a fact. They'll say, oh, I was a guy in the Prussian army in, you know, 15 or 16 or 1700, da, 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 da. My name was Joe Schmo, and I was in the 3rd Regiment, da, 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 da. And they get all this data. And it turns out that they didn't, they've never read about that. You know, they don't know anything about it, so they're just remembering all the data because they're asking questions. Here they see this guy, and he's in this Prussian uniform and whatever, and he says, well, yeah, I'm Prussian, and we're fighting the, the French, we're fighting somebody, you know, and they get the information, well, what regiment are you in? And they actually get the information. And then they go back and they check it, and sure enough, there was a guy named Joe Schmo who was in that regiment at that time, and there's some record of it, and they go, wow, this must be real. You see, this has to be real, because I didn't know anything about that. I would never studied that. I don't know anybody who ever studied that. I just had this experience. I asked the questions. I got the data. And the data actually fits. How else would I get a name, a regiment, and a battle, you know, that actually happened in history when I didn't know anything about that? Well, the conclusion then, of course, is that, you know, that past life was a real past life of his, and he got the data, and it fits. So that's happened to, you know, hundreds of people, you know, who have collected data, then gone to check the data and found real connections that were historical that they had no idea. It took a lot of digging to find that out. You know, it wasn't like in everybody's history book. It's the stuff buried that you have to dig out of, uh, of history to find it out. But now look at it from another perspective. Here's a person and they need something to help them put perspective in their life to help them understand that, that consciousness is a larger, you know, a larger system. It's not just this everyday physical reality thing. So they have this experience and they're given a, um, you know, a name, a place, an events, and so on, that then check out later. Well, maybe that's just a tool for them to have the experience, you see? But the point is that it doesn't matter if you if you use the past lives as a tool. Past, you know, this is the system. Okay, you need this incarnational system in order to continue evolving, because if you just have a one try and that's it in consciousness space in a digital space, then you don't evolve. You see, the collective wisdom in biological evolution is the physical structure of the being. It's the, you know, it's the, uh, the DNA, right, that's evolving. You might put it that way. We think of the DNA that's evolving. We think of the physical structure, that it went from fins to legs, you know, to wings, to all this stuff, because the physical structure's evolving, 
So the memory of the species is in the, is in the physical stuff, right? So that's because it's part of this virtual simulation. Okay, well, what about a consciousness system? It's just digital information. Okay. How do you learn digitally, you know, with digital information? It has to be cumulative. It has to build. So that's why we need this past life thing. You can't, you can't build this, this process if it's not cumulative. You know? So that's, the, that's why you have to keep doing this because we're not very good at changing who we are at the being level in a lifetime. Most of us take tiny, tiny, tiny steps in it because we're clueless, wandering around, not really knowing why we're here, what we're doing, and we're just bumbling through life and hopefully we make more good decisions and bad decisions and we, we gain a little. So it's a slow, slow process of changing ourselves.